Have you ever finished a great game and then thought to yourself, Wow, that was great. I wish I could play a version of this game that is inferior in every regard. Well, today is your lucky day, because today I want to talk about a forgotten game, one that you probably will only have played to completion if your PC was not very good during your childhood. And I too am one of these people, but I never truly finished the game when I was a kid, and now that I have played it and finished it, I can only say that there is a good motive this one got forgotten. Of course, I'm talking about Crusaders of Might and Magic. Hey, Henry. McCain say we might get rain. His big toe must be twitching. Anyone seen my boys? Over here, Tess. A village at peace, but not for long. For tonight brings the scourge, the terror, and the madness of the horde known as the Legion of the Fallen. They are the heralds of death who attack by night, ravaging town after town with no mercy. Attack! They are sent by Necros, master of the dead. Tales call him the greatest of all necromancers, raising his legions from the grave, but cursed with an inability to die himself. Except tonight, they have missed one, Drake. For 20 years, Drake has battled these monsters, becoming legend even among his enemies. Ever vigilant, he watches like a panther, waiting for that one moment, that opening. Crusaders of Might and Magic is an action RPG released in 1999 by Tridio, a company infamous for their console of the same name and also for trying to squeeze every inch of money out of their IPs, without reinvesting anything, especially when they were getting close to bankruptcy in 2003. I think it would be better if I elaborated on the second one. This was a time way before EA popularized loot boxes. EA Sports, it's not in a game. So the cash grab had to come from other places. The problem is that 3DO's games were starting to look more out of date in every new release. You can see that perfectly in the most known trilogy of the Might and Magic franchise. All of them use the same engine of the 6th game. Considering that all of these titles had good sales, and if you also count their sales with other titles of the time, their mismanagement starts to look like some sort of mental retardation. Just so you have a notion, Heroes of Might and Magic 3 came out the same year of Might and Magic 7, and both games had great sales. Which means they had time and money to make a new engine before their games started to look outdated. But their reputation only came to an end with Might and Magic 9. The development of this one was completely shut down, and they released an unfinished game into the market. A game that had to compete with titles like Wizardry 8 and Morrowind. Why I'm talking about so much about the main series if this game is a spin-off? Well, because I want to show the whole picture here. Crusaders of Might and Magic was being made only to the PS1, but out of nowhere. They wanted a PC version to be released at the same year, giving the developers only 7 months to finish a whole game. This got even worse when I saw that the team had to work with a 3D engine made for Requiem Avenging Angel. You must be asking, what the fuck is a Requiem Avenging Angel? It is a 3D first person shooter also released in 1989 by 3DO. Yes, they made the developers work with a 3D engine made for a first person shooter in order to make a third person RPG. 3DO at the time was being managed by another lead company, an entire board 
that didn't knew a thing about how game development work. They probably just thought that if the devs had already almost an entire game for a platform, all they needed to do was some minor changes in the game, and they would have a new version for a new platform. But each platform had very different and specific things when it came to game development. It was not simply copy and paste and make some changes. Even if you consider this version to be the truth, the developments of this game show the ugliest side of 3DO, way before the creation of Might and Magic 9. This is even worse when we realize that this type of thing was being made when the company was at its height. And unfortunately, Mighty Magic fans cannot catch a break, because the rights of the series pass from a shit company to what would become another, even greater evil. Before we begin, I must tell you that I like this game, but I don't recommend that anyone play this thing. Specifically because the only version being sold nowadays is the PC one. My affection for it is basically due to nostalgia. As you have seen in this very edgy trailer, Which was the, style at the, time? the game passes in the lands of Ardon, and we will play as Drake, a sole survivor from a village that was attacked by the Dark Legion, a undead faction controlled by a very powerful necromancer, Necros. Being fully 3D was one of the biggest appeals of this game. This was a time where 3D graphics were not only a relative new thing, it was expensive to be made, and was also a considerable more difficult thing to work with. On top of that, not many people had that much experience working with it. So, this was a 3D game, also a Might and Magic title that claimed to be an action RPG. All this while the RPG genre was still going through the fallout of Diablo 1's success. Suffice so to say that this was more than enough to tickle the balls of all the nerds that hear about this, so cool. creating a relatively big hype for the game. The same hype would blow up so hard in 3DO's face that it must have felt like a Brazilian prostitute in a discount night for its time. And considering what devs had to work with, the basic combat of the game was pretty solid. Depending on the key you are pressing, Drake will do a different attack, allowing the player to come out with some crazy combos. There is also a dodge mechanic that looks pretty cool when done right. The only problem is that the PC version had taken a lot from the PS1 version on the regard of mechanics. They did not translate it very well, and still feel very clunky when you try to play with a keyboard. Thankfully, they thought about this, and it's possible to change the controls in the game options. Some spells like Fireball are very satisfactory to cast at the start, but eventually, you will be spamming this thing so much that this feeling warns off very fast. The enemies don't have much variety. Accordingly with the game, Necros is the most powerful necromancer that ever lived. However, from what I have seen, he's capable to summon only two types of undead minions, in a setting with a ton of different kind of undead. I guess necromancy must be a new thing in Yardon. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course, how could I ever forget about the other undead enemies, aka the same two enemies with new Fortnite skins. We will also fight elementals, dashers, ogres, and ice giants. In the PC version, the game begins with Drake being put into a cell by two skeletons who apparently care more about their gambling game than their jobs. And this will be okay in my book. I too care more about my gambling games than I care for my job. The only thing is that the game portrayed Drake as this badass legendary soul survivor known even among his enemies. And this show don't seem to give a shit about that. And thanks to this, Drake manages to escape. But that's not all. Not only this dungeon is ridiculously small, there is also another very important person of interest being held here. This guy is Ursan, a big figure among the Crusaders, and the guy who points us out to the Citadel to talk to a woman called Celestia, the leader of the Crusaders. Right from this point we can see the differences between the versions of the game. The PS1 version starts in a dungeon that makes much more sense for a prisoner like Drake to be in because it looks considerably more guarded, so much so that he needs someone else's help to get out of there, and uses magic to fight against the first enemies. Which makes much more sense, and is way more satisfying than just unexplicably steal a shield and a sword from a distracted skeleton. I know this sounds just like some minor changes, but if you think about it, on a story perspective they actually do a lot for the game introduction, not only in the suspension of disbelief part, also because it keeps in mind the setting that the game had established it for itself. Drake is a legendary enemy of the Legion, and should be imprisoned in a heavily guarded, maze-like fortress, 
not in some random cell, three rooms, three enemies, and a lever away from freedom. Back in the PC version, after getting out of the stronghold, we are presented to this game's overworld, quote unquote. It's basically just a big corridor with a handful of enemies and something that 3DO called a village. Excuse me, but I do not consider 5 houses and 15 inbred looking peasants to be a village. At least not in this design, because the houses are too far away from each other. If it was the classic big circle, all houses around a main square with the NPCs scattered around it, this would be fine. You could even keep the same numbers. The only explanation I can think for the design to be like this is that 3DO must have asked for the game to take a specific time until it could be finished. So the devs had to make the whole game a giant fucking corridor. You can even interact with the villagers, but they only tell you one line of dialogue and then we can never interact with them again. But this is not even the worst part. The existence of these NPCs suggests that the devs were planning for the game to have side quests. Which would make a lot of sense, after all. This was supposed to be an RPG. But, due to the limited time and resources, the feature had to be removed. Skipping forward, we get to the second relevant character of the game, and also the one who delivers the best voice acting in this version. The beginning of the 3D gaming era was not known for subtle character design. Blimp Girl right here is one of the only two human women that don't look in bread. So, my guess is that she would be Drake's love interest in the sequel. I will speak about the voice actors in a moment. And boy oh boy, I think you'll be as surprised as I was. In this segment, the PC version kind of outshines the PS1 version on the matter of presentation. Seeing the Citadel from afar for the first time is a really cool moment, and also give us the impression that it is a giant base. Which they did manage to deliver when we get there. At first, it will seem like a maze of staircases. But after getting acquainted with the place, it is pretty easy to navigate. It is a shame that there is not much to do here besides buying or selling goods in the local shop and talking with Celestia. Speaking of which, Celestia is in the company of her personal guard. Celestia talks as if Drake owned her something, a fact that is true in the PS1 version, but in this one, it just sounds like she's trying to boss around anyone that comes into her chamber. Again, a minor change that completely altered how the characters are portrayed in both versions. In fact, even if both stories have some things that are similar, and get to the same conclusion, these are not even close to be the portraits of the same characters. If you want another example of this that is not Celestia, let's look at Necros, the big bad of this game. In the PS1 version, Drake and Necros interact multiple times along the game, with dialogues filled with taunts, threats, and mocking. Sometimes, Necros directly acts against Drake during his interactions. This might seem small, but it's the kind of thing that builds up momentum for a fight. It's the kind of thing that keeps the player invested into the game. In the PC version, the only time Drake will see and talk with Necros is at the end, on an interaction that is fucking ridiculous for both sides. For Drake, this should be the moment of his revenge against the monster that destroyed his village and made him an orphan. For Necros, it should be a final fight against the guy who's been screwing with his plans for more than 20 years. I think this is enough to prove that these stories are not the same, the characters are not the same, and the experience on this matter is not the same. Not that the story of the PS1 version is anything special, it's just that compared with the PC version story, this thing sounds like a masterpiece. If I would put a rating on both stories, the PS1 version would be a 4, or if I'm being generous, a 5 out of 10. The PC version would be a 1 or a 1.5 out of 10. If I'm feeling generous and considers that there is a setting and also an idea of what the characters should be. The story would not be a major thing to consider if this was a simulation game. I think that this version clearly tries to focus more into being, but we are talking about an RPG. From this point on, I will not compare both stories anymore. I will instead focus more on gameplay, level and character design. <laughs> oh, fucking do it again. Okay. The voice acting is another theme most people complain about. Some even say that the devs have done it themselves. I also thought this was the truth until I did some research on the cast. And you wanna know what? I will let the dialogue cutscene roll out, see if you can recognize one of these voices. Hey there, Drake. How'd your meeting with Celestia go? You're looking at the Citadel's newest hero. Can you get me down from here? Aye, hop aboard. Something tells me your adventures are just beginning. 
Rick is voiced by no one less than Kevin Conroy. If you don't know this name, here's a hint. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. The majority of this game's voice acting cast are very big names, like Simon Templeman, King Ward, and Jack Angel. The Blimp Girl is voiced by Jackie Gono. This brings the question. If you have all those big names, how come the voice acting is so shit in this game? I think the answer is in the writing. There is only so much someone can do with a bad material, despite how much talent and ability they have. Take Drake for example, almost all of his lines are supposed to sound as if the character did not give a shit about what is happening. The voice actor only portrayed the character accordingly. Or, you know, he read the script and thought that the story sucks ass, draining his passion for the project and becoming something mundane. Another possible comparison between versions would be with Celestia. At least they have managed to make her look homely in both versions. Speaking of which, after talking to Celestia, Drake is charged with acquiring a horn with the dwarfs of the city of Corantha, so we can impregnate the impregnable fortress using it. They say it's impregnable. Give me ten good men and some climbing spikes. I'll impregnate the bitch. I like you. If we look at the map, we can see that the city is on the other side of the world and we have to pass through the catacombs and the school to get there. The catacombs is a dungeon that was added only in the PC version. And excluding one single part, this probably is the most interesting and complex dungeon of both versions, with multiple points to explore and also serving as a link to all other places of the map. The enemies are also well placed and it feels good to hack through all hordes of enemies having to carefully strategize our sword and shield game. The first time I saw one of these earth elementals as a kid, I almost panicked when this gorilla-like thing came running at Mac 5 in my direction. You know, this jumping segment would bring the whole quality of the game up if it was simply removed. Because having to deal with the clunky jump mechanics of this game is a pain in the ass. The worst part is that this is the only really considerable segment of the game where this mechanic is relevant. If it did not exist, that would make the experience better for the players. But of course, doing so would be unproductive for 3DO, because, you see, they wanted the game to take a certain amount of hours to be completed, and this segment serves exactly to do this. It would not be that bad if I could not tell some things were put into the game to take time for the sake of taking time. Speaking of which, let's get into the worst segment of this game. This could at first seems like a breeze of fresh air. You just came out of the narrow corridors of the catacombs into an area that has a lot of space, and thankfully, another color palette that's not brown. There is also some variety in enemies that's very welcome. Since the game started, we only fought against two types of enemies, three if you count the skeleton in another skin. Yeah, all of those things will become infuriating really fast. The new enemies only walk in groups, run towards you like a very high and very motivated crackhead meaning that they can swarm you in a matter of seconds if you are not careful. The ogres are not that remarkable, besides their design that is kind of funny. A tall, body positive neckbeard with a receding hairline, boom, there is an ogre. Being happy for finally being to an open space turns out to feel like a monkey's paw kind of thing, because the game did not put you here so you can breathe, it put you here so you can lose yourself into this hellhole that you will get to walking in circles because this green fucking fog considerably reduces your field of view. This wood broke me. The bad things had surpassed the good ones. I was planning to doing this video with a way more charitable and light-hearted tone, but this segment was so bad, and together with the other things I have already listed, it made me forget about my nostalgia for the game, and believe me, this is a hard thing to do. Getting into Corentha, the game manages to pass that feeling of being in a crowded space. Corentha is an extremely short segment, and also the one with the best atmosphere in this version. We speak with the Dwarven Council. They say that only their prince can give us the MacGuffin we came here to retrieve. Also, they are in the middle of a civil war, and their prince, who is technically now their leader, is a prisoner of the rebels. I'm no expert in this matter, but... I don't think these guys are a very competent governmental body. Anyway, we dive into the Corantha mines and put down a whole rebellion by ourselves. This dungeon is short and there is nothing remarkable about it. This rebellion feels more like a riot with 12 angry miners starving inside a mine 
infested with earth elementals. We rescue the prince and bring him to the Dwarven Council. Even after explaining to the prince that the situation is critical and that we need the MacGuffin, he refuses to give it to us. Because accordingly to the Dwarven bureaucracy, only the king can give it to someone else. And he cannot be crowned the king if he is not in the possession of the king's staff. And this same staff was stolen by the ogres in Duskwood. Look, this is an urgent situation. And they still cling to dumb bureaucracy. This probably was a thing that affected the whole Dwarven society and probably was the main cause of the rebellion we just put it down. Hands. Are we the baddies? Yeah, the main cause is not elaborated in this version, so this is my head canon now. We retrieve the staff from an ogre in Duskwood, come back, and the now king of the dwarves give us the so precious MacGuffin. Now we just have to run all the way back to the citadel in order to give the MacGuffin to Celestia, including this fucking jumping part. That's now got even worse due to magic casting skeletons that can stop your jumping animation or make Drake give a little step backwards if it hits you. This is not a problem in playing round, but it's enough to push you out of these pillars. To add insults to injury, the game now started to have a bug that halts your jumping animation mid-air, as if you we were trying to jump and hit at the ceiling with your head. The only way I managed to pass through it was by save scamming. Are you having fun already? On the way back, I noticed that some of the civilian NPCs started to be substituted by the Crusaders. It's a small detail, but helps with the sense of progression. This was a clever move from the devs. This time Blimp Girl is not here to take us to the Citadel. Apparently Celestia sent her and some other crusaders on a mission at the Glaciers. In the Citadel, Drake talks with Celestia and she informs us that she sent Ursan, that same guy from the start of the game, to the Glaciers in order to retrieve a thing that she did not want to talk about. Instead, she just sent us there to help. This means we have to pass once again by the same places we ran through three fucking times already. On the way to the catacombs, this hobo looking lady gives us an amulet that unlocks the full potential of our autism, allowing us to finally see the ethereal world, and also that some of the crusaders are possessed by these floating enemies. But we can do much against them right now, so let's just keep going. This time, the true main villain of this game is at the height of its power. Not only you have all the other problems I have already listed, the place is now swarming with skeletons that can cast magic. From this point on I could only keep playing by exploiting the game, spamming the fireball spell and chugging up mana potions. I wanted to get excited for a new area of the game. But after it obligated me to do the same old areas four times, I was completely numb to the new content. For now, the glaciers will have only two types of enemies, ice elementals and ice giants. At first I tried to fight them, but I was burning through all my health potions and decided to just ignore them. And when I couldn't just run past the enemies, I abused the fireball spell. After descending into the ice giant's tuning cave, you just have to turn left and end this bifurcation right here. You turn right. That will take you straight up to the main chamber. Before entering, just spam fireball. It's not worth to fight all these guys. They are too big, so the shield won't stop their attacks. We find Ursan in his cell, and got teleported to the Blink Girl. Ah, so the game can manage fast travel. Hmm, good to know. Somehow this got me even more pissed at the game. Ursan sent us to speak with the Dwarf King and ask for his help in the final battle against Necros. My reaction after hearing this was... Because I thought I would have to backtrack all the way to the catacombs. And then I noticed this other path that leads directly into the squads. Almost right out of the gate, we encounter this possessed Dasher. Drake defeats him and before he dies, he says that he saw into the creature's memories and there is a spell that can expel these guys from the body of the host without killing the host itself. Where is this spell, you ask? Into the fucking glaciers. So yes, the game forced me to backtrack the exact same path I just did, but this time, in the cave. You have to turn left again, encounter this big flying ship and enter it. They even put this guy at the door but it took me some time to figure out there's a door there. 
entering the ship we find the same black knights that were guarding Celeste in her chamber. They look tough at first, but this place is too narrow, so it's really easy to make them fall. There is a motive for them to be here, it's just not to explain this version because, again, the devs had only 7 months to do all this and probably never got the time to tie up the story. In the PS1 version this is explained at the end of the game, it unfortunately would take too much time to explain and the full story is not worth your time, so here's the short version. Celestia is a betrayer. Unlike the PC version where he just stand around in his gunning chamber, in the PS1 version Necros has a well defined goal. He seeks the power of a race called Kriegans, basically they are the devils of the mighty magic universe. Celestia is also trying to reach this power for her own benefit. They probably had to put them here because 3DO was planning to make an entire spin-off series after this game. And in the next one Celestia would be the main villain and Drake was going to hunt her down. Warriors of Might and Magic was supposed to be the sequel of this game. In fact, the team started to develop this right after Crusaders of Might and Magic was done. 3DO was the one who decided to not try and redeem this game. I will not dive into it, but Warriors is what Crusaders could have been. Warriors only had a PS1 version on release and the ratings were mixed. Again, this probably was due to 3DO because they were constantly clashing with the dev team during the creation of this game. Back in Duskwood, we talk with the dashers guarding this gate. If you come here without the spellbook, they will not allow you to pass, and this cutscene will not trigger. In this cutscene, Drake frees the infected dashers using his new spell and make an alliance with the dasher chief. Then we have to travel to Coranta in order to speak with the dwarf king. There, Drake sees that one of his advisors is possessed and uses his new spell. He seals the alliance with the dwarves, and we can finally go to the stronghold. To be honest, this little village at the entrance is more interesting than the stronghold itself. I wish they could have done something else with it, but I guess they did not have the time. This is the saddest part of playing a game like this, seeing what could have been done, if things had not gone through this way. The stronghold is a big maze of corridors and stairs, well, this time I can't even complain about the level design, castles in real life were also made like this on purpose. But in a game it's just repetitive, which would be tolerable if I was not playing repetition simulator the game already. You will have to explore the stronghold until you get to this big room with tortures and armors all around. Now a quick question, if you see this room with this big door, what would you do? Come on, I will give you some time to answer. If your answer was, try to find a way to open one of these seemingly important doors, well, you are wrong. Naturally, you would have to go downstairs, walk until you see a window and jump down, so you can get to the place we were at the beginning of the game and open the door for the Crusaders. We don't see Celeste among the Crusaders. If you go down the road, you will see Blink Girl at the distance. She says that Celestia ran away to other place with her most trusted guard, and we are on our own to solve everything. She also says that she can take us to Necros, who is in his airship. Well, one of the writers sure did have something for flying. Oh no. Necro ships a minuscule segment, with some annoying enemies that are only here so the game can give you health potions in an indirect way. Getting at Necro's chamber, we catch him, in the middle of his goon sash. They have the dialogue I commented earlier and start the most anticlimactical battle I have ever played. Not sure what this purple shield does, but you just have to hit him until it turns off. After beating Necro's, there is no victor speech or final consideration from any side. The game just cuts to the scene where we receive praise from all these NPCs that I care so little I can't even remember their names right after playing the entire game. In this cutscene, they tease a possible sequel and make Drake the new leader of the Crusaders. As I said before, I have played this game when I was a kid. It was one of the only games my PC could run and I have nice memories of it. I wanted to look over the huge plots of this game and speak only about my nostalgia for it but unfortunately this was not possible. Not only because I saw how bad this game was while replaying, but there is also the story of its development. If it was not for 3D and its desperation to release this game, it could have been something else. I can only imagine the frustration of the devs that worked for them. 
The PS1 devs that had the reputation of the game they were developing for over a year destroyed because a Wing Fury version was released shortly before. And the frustration of the PC team that had to work for 7 months in a doomed project. It's admirable that despite this fact, they clearly tried their best to patch together a whole game from start to finish. And we can only imagine what a team with this level of dedication could have achieved if they got more time to work with it. And to these devs, I'm truly sorry I can't praise your hard work on this game, because of what this title unfortunately represents. Crusaders of Might and Magic is a testament to Trivial's incompetence, greed, lack of care for its fans and for the hard work of its employees. To the viewers that have good memories of this game, I hope you can see my point here. My objective was not to diminish these good memories or love you have for this game. If you got here, please consider liking and subscribing. Stay tuned. There'll be more to come soon.